In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of plant nomenclature. And we're going to start discussing two different types of problems that occur in nomenclature. One of these problems occurs when we have different plants, but they are given the same name. They're obviously done the, given the same name by different authors. And this is the problem that we call the problem of homonyms. Homo means same. And nim means name. So the Greek roots of this word tell us exactly what the problem is. It's the same name for different plants. Well, the complementary problem occurs when we have one plant, but it's given different names, again, by different authors. This is the problem of synonyms. Syn means with or together. And nim, of course, means name. So same name, different plant. Well, before we get too far into this, let's just remember what the International Code tells us. The International Code of Nomenclature tells us. That is, what are the main activities that it, uh, it governs? And those are, it governs the naming of new taxa. We've dealt with that in previous videos. But it also talks about um, determining what the legitimate name is. Remember, legitimate means which name follows the rules. So it determines which um, name follows the rules for name taxa that have been divided in some way, that have been broken up. That is, someone before said it was all big one genus, and now someone has broken it up into separate genera. What's the correct names there? What is the legitimate names there? Taxa that have been united, that were previously separated into two different genera, for instance, have now been united into a genus or that have been transferred from one genus. A species has been moved from one genus to another because some taxonomists said, well, that's not really a Calathea, that's a Renealmia, et cetera, move these things around, or that they've been changed in rank in somehow. Determining what the correct name is requires the judgment of a taxonomist. Taxonomists write some type of a work and in that work, they specify what the correct name is for each taxon. It is the correct name according to them. It has to be legitimate, has to follow the rules, but they are the ones that are determining what is correct. The code does also not tell us which one, which name is right. So there could be more than one correct name. That is, there could be more than one treatment. And you have to decide which one of those treatments you think is right, which one of those names you think is right. And the example we used in previous videos was that we ha might have Small's flora of the southeastern United States and Weekly's flora of the United States. And for some taxa, they don't agree on what the correct name is. Who are you going to follow, Small or Weekly? So that's a judgment uh, that every scientist who's using those floras has to make. OK, homonyms, same name for different plants. So here we've got two different species represented by two different type specimens. So these are two different herbarium specimens, different plants, but we look up here, they have been given the same name, Astragalus rhizanthus. They've been doing, given these names by two different authors, Boissier in one case and Royal in another. So obviously, whoever did this work later didn't know about the earlier person's work. So let's look at the dates. We've got them over here to the left. So Boissier worked in 1843. I've put his date here, 1843, when he published this name in brackets because it is not a part of the species name. You don't, that it, we never write the date in which it was published as part of the species name. It's always just the generic name, the specific epithet, and the author. But we need to know the date that he did the, um, publish this name in order to determine if it's legitimate or not, and 1843 is that date. 
Here's a little information about who this guy was, Boissier. So Royal, in 1835, he named this a different plant, Astragalus rosanthus. Here he is, John Forbes Royal. Which of these names is a legitimate name? Well, we are going to look to the principle of priority. Principal or prior is going to tell us. And so that's going to say that the earlier name is the valid one, the one that was done first, is going to be legitimate, and so the legitimate name is the one by Royal. So whatever plant this one was, this plant, this taxon, gets the name Astragalus rhizanthus. And the other plant, the plant that was used by Royal, This one must be renamed. Astragalus <clears throat> rosanthus bossier is not a valid name for this plant. So it's got to find a new name. And some attacks on us will come along and do that. Look at another example. Okay, here we have Impatius Capensis by Thunberg, named in 1794, and Impatius Capensis by Merberg, a different plant, named by um, Merberg in 1775, which one has to be renamed. Now, I said renamed here, so it's the later one. So that is this one. Impatius Capensis by Thunberg must be renamed. Why did this occur? Well, this problem occurred because It was renamed, and it was renamed by Impatius <clears throat> Duthii, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, by Volus in 1921. Quite a long time after the problem originated, and but as I say, that's very typical in taxonomy for these kinds of things to move slowly. Synonyms. Synonyms are a little more complex. There's two basic types of synonyms. Synonyms from errors. And two, synonyms from combinations or splitting. And this second category has subtypes. So there's several different varieties of <clears throat> synonyms from, com from combinations or splitting. And we'll talk about those as we go on. So let's look at synonyms from errors. Different names for the same plant. So here we have a single plant, a single taxon. It's been given two names. Linnaeus gave it agave virginica, and Salisbury gave it agave pallida. Now, we know that Linnaeus worked in uh, 1753. His major work was 1753, and this, so this was named in 1753. So you really can't get any earlier than that. So Salisbury just goofed up here. He didn't look at Linnaeus's work, he didn't know that he had named this plant already. Salisbury was working in 1796. 
and gave it a different name. So obviously, we have to choose the name that is the earlier one, and so this, Linnaeus's name, is legitimate. And Salisbury name becomes a synonym, so we say it's placed into synonymy. placed into synonymy with agave virginica. So this is originated because this one taxonomist, Salisbury in this case, didn't know the work of the earlier taxonomist, Linnaeus, in this case. <clears throat> Those kinds of errors are very easy to figure out. We always use the principle of priority to determine which is the legitimate name. OK, let's look at how synonyms occur from combinations or from splitting. I said there are two major ways that this happens, and one of those ways has um, some subversions of it. Taxons can be combined with some other taxa, or they can be split. Let's look at those first. So when we talk about combinations, we really mean that there are, for instance, two different genera. They've been recognized as two different genera in legitimate ways. But a taxonomist comes along and says, ah, those two genera are really not separate from each other. I'm going to stick them all together in one genus. What is the valid name for that? So we've taken all the species that were in this one genus and we stuck them into the other one. Taxon splitting is exactly the opposite. You've got a single major large genus and it's going to be split up into two different genera by some taxonomist. So again, it involves multiple species. When a taxon is changed in rank, it's moved from one level of the hierarchy to another level of the hierarchy. We're not going to say very much about this type of change, but it is one of the things that's governed by the code. Change in position, we will say a little bit about this. This is when we have a single, let's say a species, and it's moved from one genus to another. So the difference between this and a combination is with a combination, we're dealing with whole sets of species that are moved around. In this number four, we are dealing with a single taxon, a single species that is being moved from one genus to another. An author comes around and says, OK, you say this is Calathea. It's been named Calathea for a number of years, but it's really not Calathea. It's Arenealmia. We're going to move it over. I'm going to move it over to Arenealmia. So that's the fourth type. Combinations. So we'll look at a couple examples of combinations. So let's say we've got two gen genera, Diplicus and Mimulus. They've been put into one genus. They've been united into a genus, Mimulus, by some author, taxonomist. Let's say it's named Smith. <clears throat> How do we know which name is that new genus? So we've put two things together. What do we call that new genus? Do we call it Diplicus or do we call it Mimulus. And so we use the principle of priority again to determine this. The oldest name is used for this new taxon. OK, another example. Solania was named by Linnaeus. Echinocarpus was described by Bloom quite a bit later. And they were united by Jones. So when Jones united these two, he said that all of the Echinocarpuses are really in the same genus as what Linnaeus described as Solania. What's the new name for this? Well, of course, it has to be the older name. Solania. Echinocarpus, what happens to that? It is now a synonym of Solania. It is placed into synonymy with that.
Why has it been placed into synonymy? Well, it is the judgment of a taxonomist. It is the judgment of Jones that these are both the same genus. It's because of this taxonomic judgment of Jones that Solania and Echinocarpus were put together. So now what has to happen? The species that were used to be called Echinocarpus now have to be transferred to Solania. And they're going to get a second authority now. So let's take an example. Here's Echinocarpus alba. Bloom described it. <clears throat> it's united with Solania by Jones. What's the new name going to be? Well, we are going to give credit to both Bloom and Jones. We are going to give credit for, to Bloom for saying, this is a species. This is a unique taxon. We are going to give credit to Jones for saying, oh, this really is a Solania. And so the name's going to look like this. Solania, Alba, Bloom, and Jones. Bloom is the parenthetical authority. And that's the person who described the species. Jones is the combining authority. And he proposed the new combination. Now, I've called Jones here the combining authority. Actually, you can't tell just from this name. From this name here, you cannot tell whether Jones proposed a combination or a split. We'll look at a split later. But uh, you can tell that he did something. And you would have to go and look at the original author on um, the original publications to determine exactly what Jones did. But in this case, we know what he did. He, was the com <clears throat> he combined the two genera, and so we call him the combining authority. Changes in position of a single taxon. Okay, well, this is just a variation of a combination, as I've said. It is a variation on a combination because we're just moving a single taxon. Instead of moving all the the Echinocarpus into Solanea, we're moving just one, for instance. Well, here's an example. Goodedia, and I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce this right, Dudliana by I. Abrams was transferred to Clarkia by Horton. The new species, Clarkia Dudliana, has two authorities, Abrams and Horton. How would we write that? Clarkia Dudliana. Abrams is our parenthetical authority. Horton is our combining authority, or transferring authority, we would say more correctly in this case. And we can tell something then by, from, <clears throat> we can tell what's going on by these names here. Abrams described the species originally. Horton did something here, in this case, moving it to a new, a new genus. OK, taxa may also be split talked about combinations so far, but they can be split. So there's this <coughs> story of the genus Roos in the Encardiaceae. Now, Roos is a genus when con um, conceived in the wide sense, with containing lots of species, that contains poison ivy. It's gone through periods of time where people have split it up into separate genera and combined it back to one single genus Roos. In fact, I think this has happened three or four times in my lifetime now. When it's split up, the genus Toxicodendron is the genus that includes poison ivy.
So it's got some economic and cultural significance here, the fact that <clears throat> we keep moving Rus around and splitting it up or putting it together again. So splitting it up right now, so Rus, let's say we were at a time where it's, some authorities have said it's all one genus. It could be split into Melosma, Rus, and Toxicodendron into three different genera. The original name, how do we know where that name of Rus goes? And we know that, or we can figure that out by looking at where the um, type specimen is. So in other words, the original name, Rus, is going to be retained for the group of species that contain the type specimen of Rus. The original name, and in that case, the original name is Bruce in this case. Retained for the taxon, and that in this case, that's the taxon is a genus. Right? So it contains the type specimen of Roos. So that makes sense. That name, Roos, is always going to follow that type around, that individual plant, because we're 100% certain that Roos, that name, applies to that herbarium specimen. So if you split other things away from that genus, those have to be renamed, and new types have to be designated for each of those names. There has to be a type specimen for Toxicodendron, a type specimen for Melosma, etc. But Roos has still got that type specimen and the group, the species that are around that that are retained in Roos, retain the name Roos. So here is a summary of that. When a taxon is split, the original name has to be retained for the taxon that contains the type specimen. And another example, take the genus Aeschylus, was defined or named by Linnaeus. It's the a horse chestnut. It was split into Aeschylus and Pavia. Well, let's say, no, it was sections. There are sections Aeschylus and Pavia. And if they were split into new genera, the name Aeschylus has to be retained for section Aeschylus. Section Aeschylus, that section that contains the type specimen. contains the type specimen of Aeschylus, and so the generic name has to follow that type specimen. It's retained for that section. So there's the type specimen. It's associated with this species, Aeschylus hippocastanum, hippocastanum, and this is the horse chestnut. So we have to get a new name for the other section, for the ones in section Pavia, and there has to be a new type specimen for that. And so let's just say that that new name was Paviopsis, and it was created for the old section Pavia, and there has to be a new type specimen then.
Okay, so what happens to the individual taxa, the individual species? So we've got a member of the section pavia, let's say it's Aeschylus neglecta, right? So we know now this is being moved to a new genus, Paviopsis. So it's going to have a new name. The new name is going to be that generic name, Paviopsis, neglecta. And now there's going to be two authorities, Lindell, who described Aeschylus neglecta, and Jones, who split the taxa, the splitting authority. When we look at the, na when we look at the <coughs> names and see that they're associated with a single type specimen, so here is single type. This is the type of, originally, Aeschylus neglecta by Lindell. We need that extra name on there to know who's Aeschylus, who named Aeschylus neglecta. So that's that type specimen. And we look at the <coughs> names associated with that, we see Lindell's name associated with it, but we see Lindell and Jones with this other name. Paviopsis neglecta. Now, how do we know that those things are going to be all there because that these names are all associated with this type specimen? There is an additional label that's added to the specimen. So that label might be over here. The annotation label, it's called. There's a number of types of annotation labels. But there's an annotation label, and that annotation label is going to say on it this. It's going to have that name on it. So that will be indicate that there have been different ways in which this type specimen has been interpreted. So you can look, and at these types, you can find a history of the renaming, naming and renaming of each specimen. And here we have an example of that. Here's an annotation label. Unfortunately, the resolution here is not good enough for me to zoom in on that, but there's an annotation label. So there is the original label. There is the herbarium label there. There's the original label. And there is the annotation label. Okay, what is the story of these specimens? Costus Cernus, Schwartz X. Romer, and Schultes versus Linealmia Cernua. The names, the endings changed because of Latin grammar. Schwartz X. Romer, X. Schultes in parentheses, and McBride. So there's a little bit of confusion here because of this Schwartz, X, Romer, and Schultes. Um, let's just leave that aside for a second. We'll look at that in the next slide. Let's just say that's one name, right? Just say that that was Schwartz. So Schwartz and in parentheses and McBride outside of parentheses. Over here, Schwartz. They're both, we're looking at um, two different type specimens but they're of the same species. Whether it's costus or renealmia requires a judgment of a taxonomist. And that taxonomist here is McBride. So he moved it, that species, to Renealmia, and the names after it tell us the history of that. Hint. Okay, let's take a look at these abbreviations that we've seen on the last slide. The most common one you're going to see as you study taxonomy is this one, X. 
and what it means is validly published by. Now let me say a little more about that by looking at an example. So here we have a species name and we've got two authorities connected by this word X. First, who are these guys? First, Asa Gray was a botanist working at the Harvard Herbarium. He was the first really famous American botanist. Green I don't know so much about, but I do know, because of this X, that Green was the person who described this species originally, and he did something wrong in publishing it. There are many kinds of mistakes that he could have made, but let's just say that he did not effectively publish it. So let's say he, Green created a notebook, and he had a very good field notebook, he had Latin descriptions, he had everything he needed to recognize this species, but he never effectively published it in a journal that was accessible to other botanists. Along comes Gray. Gray, nice guy that he is, says, oh, look, I know that Green was the first person to describe this species, but he never got around to publishing it. So I'm going to publish him for it. I'm going to publish it for him. So Gray essentially fixed the problem. In this case, because we're assuming that Green never effectively published the name, Gray effectively published the name. And I think that's pretty char characteristic or pretty um, typical for these types of problems where you see this word X appearing that the second author's name after the X effectively published something that the first author described but never got around to publishing. I think that's a pretty typical kind of thing. But there are other kinds of problems that could be there. It could be that the first author described it and never put a Latin description in when he published it, etc. And then someone had to come along and effectively publish it and badly publish it by putting the Latin description in. So sometimes these kinds of things are abbreviated. That is, this X and the first author's name is not absolutely required to be there. We can sometimes just recognize Asa Gray as the author of the name. Let's go back to our last slide and look at our names again now on this slide and see what we've got here. So we've got Schwartz X, there's our X, Romer and Schultes. Well, so Romer and Schultes, that's pretty easy. And doesn't have any kind of special meaning, it just means they work together. Okay, so they co-published it. It was an, an idea that they did, the thing that they did together. Schwartz was the person who described the species originally, but he made some kind of mistake. It was not validly published. So this kind of complex formulation then, Schwartz x Romer and Schultes, is just what we've described. Schwartz describing it, Romer and Schultes fixing the problem. And then McBride came along and said, well, it's not a costus, it's a renomia. The other type of <clears throat> abbreviation that you might see relatively frequently is x. X means a hybrid. So you might see it written in several different ways. The way that I really prefer is like this because it's easy to tell what the two original species are. Salvia apiana and Salvia clevandii. X between them, meaning this new species is a hybrid between them, or this new descri described hybrid is a hybrid between them. They can also be given this kind of a name, salvia x palmeri, in this case gray and green. We know about what those kinds of two names mean now. We really want to look at just the x. It means that's a hybrid species. And you would have to go back and look at the original publications to see which two species were hybridized, probably natural hybridization, 
to produce this species, Salvia palmari. Well, that's our description of the problems that we find occur in taxonomy and how the code suggests that we solve them.